Yes, yeah, on, on the top band. And uh, there was a little misprint in the uh, in the dinner uh, deal here. We 53 years. It's actually 59, 59 years that John has been a ham and uh, started out through Boy Scouts. He's an active member of the Frankfurt Radio Club and uh, he likes the contests, uh, but really an active DXer and always looking for a new one on the top band. Let's give a nice top band welcome to John. KJ7U screwdriver, and by the time uh, I got rid of that setup, about uh, 12 or 14 years later, I had 54 countries on 160. The very first one out, the day we put the, after we had put the antenna on the car, I worked VK3ZL. Oh. And just to prove it wasn't a fluke, an hour later I worked them again. <laughs> uh, that was the best DX ever worked. We worked a bunch of Europeans. So it was a lot of fun with that setup. And many of the things that made that a good setup for me in my daily commute, and that's the only time I used it, was in the daily commute with an occasional trip to a ham fest. Uh, I didn't go down to the beach and sit next to salt water to try and work new countries. This was just to help make my hour long commute a little bit uh, more sane experience. And it worked very well for that. Uh, along Delaware Route 1, that's going up and down the state, north to south. I uh, had, had this long drive. It was a fairly new highway, no power lines. It's a diesel engine, no ignition noise. I could out hear base stations on much of the DX. It was that quiet. So it was fun. Of course, I didn't work all those guys because <laughs> they couldn't hear me. Uh, G3 PQA probably had the best years in Europe, but I worked him a half a dozen times. And uh, we had a lot of fun with it. I got my start, uh, as Tim mentioned, uh, way back in 1964, WN3BGN, after doing some SWLing on an old Zenith floor, floor console radio. Then when I upgraded to General, got WA3 BGN. And that was in 1965. <laughs> My very first contact on 160 was W8CLH. I don't know if any of you knew him. Uh, and my first top NDX was VP9 EU in 1966. But I really didn't get into 160 till into the mid and later 70s. Uh, my first European that I work, actually worked was in 1975, G3XVY. And when we, Jeannie and I purchased our first house in Connecticut in 1978, had a whole fifth of an acre to uh, put some antennas on and room for an inverted L. And we, uh, 
and started to work countries on 160. And we had, I had some good vendors back then. K1 PBW, W1BB, who was the very first to get the XCC on 160. W8LRL, thank you all. Uh, W8JI and many others along the way helped me learn about the band, how to work DX on it, uh, beverage and tenants are receiving and, and other ideas. In 1981, just before moving to Delaware, I managed to work VS60 in Hong Kong. And it was then I realized you really could work around the world on 160. It always fit in easily with my job. I was working for a newspaper, working a night schedule, and I could home at midnight. The rest of the ham radio world was asleep. <laughs> but it was still wide open on 160 to Europe, so it was pretty easy to pick up new countries. In 1983, I earned DXCC number 27 uh, while we were on an acre lot in Bear, Delaware. Later, we moved to this house in uh, north of Wilmington, Delaware, on two acres. And I, I have to thank my wife. When we went house hunting over the years, there was only one issue. How big is the lot? <laughs> and those of you putting antennas up on 160, I'm sure you know what I mean. One morning, uh, DJ28EH showed up on 160, operating from FW2EH, Wallace Island, one that I needed. And I copied him easily for some time. But I called and called. And on this tower, I had a half wave sloper which favored Europe. And it had a 10 dB null to the west. So while everybody all in the northeast around me was working FW2EH, I was coming up dry. And the sun came up, and about an hour after sunrise, he was finally fading into the noise. So I threw in the towel. I couldn't hear him anymore. I went downstairs. The ham shack was on the third floor. I went down to the kitchen, made coffee and breakfast. About 20 minutes later, I'm back in the shack. The rig's still on, and I'm still hearing FW2EH. I found out later he had a full-size Titan X vertical sitting on the edge of the salt water, and he didn't fade, fade out till a full two hours uh, after my sunrise. Wow. And I was kicking myself for giving up those 20 minutes. I might have worked. <laughs> so I learned that you just have to stick with it, day in, day out, and uh, don't give up just because you're not working and keep trying. It wasn't until the summer of 2007 that I had another chance at FW. And I learned to always be prepared. Jeannie and I were heading to Maine on vacation, and along the way, I checked the internet and learned that. Um, KM9D was going to be operating from FW0MO. He'd been sailing around the Pacific, stopping at different islands and getting on. So I had an IC706 along. I had a little bit of coax and some wire. When we got to the cabin in overlooking Rangeley, Make, Rangeley Lake in Maine, I set up an inverted L with all of about 20 foot vertical on a, hanging from a tree. <laughs> and much to my surprise, the next morning, I could hear him. <laughs> it was quiet. This is the end of, mid, end of July, and I could hear him. But he couldn't hear me. <laughs> so I tried for a couple of days. Every day it got noisier and noisier, back to normal summer conditions. Still couldn't work. There's no radio shack for 50 miles. I go down to the only thing in town that might have wire in the local home center. But they had wire, steel wire, fence wire. <laughs> but I bought it. <laughs> laid down some more radials, and after a week of trying, I finally got it. <laughs> <laughs> that's the part to prove it. Wow. <laughs> okay, 1997, thanks to my wife changing uh, a job. Uh, we ended up looking for land in Lower Delaware. I had to commute to the north, he had to commute to the south, so we actually found a place on Mid-State Road, right in the middle of the state. 
the uh, original property was the, the lower half of this, uh, 12 acres. And in 2014, we added another five and a half acres above it. We moved in on December 19th, or I'm sorry, we settled on December 19th, we moved in a day or two later. We, we had boxes piled high in every room. We had downsized from a much bigger house. And Christmas morning came, so I was up early. Didn't have a rig yet, didn't have any antennas up, but I found the TS-940 uh, box that we moved down and didn't have any wire. I found an extension cord and stripped the ends, ends off of it, so I had a six-foot antenna stuck it, stuck it in the SO239 on the back. I turn it on and start tuning around 160, of course. And much to my surprise, there was a JA. Okay. And another. <laughs> and another. And before the sun came up, I had heard a half dozen JAs. So I knew I had found a good location. <laughs> and that's a lot about what it is, you know, being in a quiet spot. Just like that driving down Route 1, being in a quiet spot, I could hear stuff that other guys couldn't hear. Since then, there's been development around us. The uh, 50 head of cattle that resided on our east side is now 42 homes. They just finished the last one. Uh, to, our, to our west, a half a mile, is a development that's gonna eventually have 200 homes. So with these homes, of course, there are all kinds of RFI sources. So we have a lot of incentives to help, uh, help hear better. And we have more antennas. These are three towers. And this is an overview of what we've got. There's more, but I couldn't fit them in. Um, okay, down here at the bottom, these red dots, these red dots, uh, that's the eight towers. Most of them are about 100 feet. Two of them are 120, one of them is 40. Uh, and, and we work some higher band stuff occasionally, so we've got Yaggies on these, some of these towers, and stacks and all that stuff, and I know this group doesn't care about that. Um, the single, the thinner lines here are single wire beverages, crisscrossing in various directions. That's, of course, Europe to the upper right. The best European antenna is a thick, green line, the thicker lines are phase beverages. And that's about a 1,400 foot long stagger phase beverage, beverage pair. And the other thick lines are other phase beverages we have in various directions. And these green and blue dots are the short vertical arrays for receiving. They are typically spaced uh, a footprint of 300 feet by 80 feet. And they vary depending on the direction and space available. And these are as good, sometimes better, than the beverages for receiving. In the very upper right, there are two dots that are end fire for receiving in band. I, I can null out my transmit signal enough that I can listen across the band when I'm transmitting uh, this is mostly used in the 160 meter contest. Okay, uh, the tower on the right is the driven element on 160. This is a K3LR array, thank you Tim, um, which uses parasitic wire elements hanging off the tower to produce a three element uh, array in three directions, and toward Europe, I have an extra director, which makes it a four element array in that direction. For about 5.3 dB gain toward Europe, the extra element has a, just under a dB of gain, so it's over six dB in that direction, over a single vertical. Uh, this tower sits on big insulators, uh, power, power line kind of insulators, uh, so it's series fed with a tuning network at the base, the big um, coils of coax on the PVC forms are chokes, an idea I got from WHJI, uh, to isolate the antennas that are on the top uh, of the tower, the, the Aggies and the, and the uh, rotor cable that's going up the tower, 
So they're out of the picture as far as the RF is concerned. Okay, this is the sky view again. Uh, this is the urban element, the blue dot. Uh, that's toward Europe, the four elements that work together parasitically um, in the other directions. Of course, I had this array up for quite a few years. I first put it up in 1998. Initially, the tower was only 100 feet. And when the tower went up higher, it enabled the parasitic elements uh, to be uh, a bit higher. And, it, and I found that to be much more effective. <clears throat> but it wasn't good enough. So we figured out, looking at our property layout, that we could squeeze in a broadside end fire array. That's four elements, four vertical elements. Uh, since we already had one that we were going to use that's in the K3LR array, the one that's the green and red dot there, we mashed all the other elements to that. They're, they're T-shaped, uh, 58, I'm sorry, 73 and a half feet vertical with a 58 foot top hat. And they're resonant around 1930 kilohertz so that they could be directors in the K3LR array. And in the broadside end prior array, we had a coil at the base to bring them down to about 1830. This array is at the moment fixed toward Europe. The two forward elements uh, are fed in phase with equal three quarter wavelength speed lines of uh, seven eighths inch hard line. You don't need that, but I happen to have some, so I use it. And the two rearward elements are <coughs> inverted L's and they're grounded through a coil to resonate just below the band and they, they are the reflectors in the array. Eventually the plan is to make this a full phase array switchable in two directions. This is the extra uh, director toward Europe, another set of insulators to put the RON25 off the ground. And there's a little relay in here which switches this in and out depending on the direction that's selected. That's just some details about the broadside and fire array. Each element has 120 radials, each 130 feet long. And this is a, a tower. Originally, this was going to be used for 80 meters, but when I got the idea for the broadside and fire array, it, that switch to be a support for the one of the uh, broadside and fire uh, verticals. Okay, <clears throat> things are nice and neat in little boxes. Not at my station. <laughs> we do a lot of breadboarding. I, I put th this is one of the short verticals for receiving. It's got a little matching network. It's all taped and wire tied to a, a piece of PVC that's sitting over a, a ground rod. And of course, that's just temporary. Mm, since, about, since about 2007. <laughs> In fact, the JA short vertical array, the contest was coming out. I wanted to get this up. I ran out of time to add the matching. So I just hooked the elements. The elements in all these short receive arrays are 34 feet long, their wires are hung from trees. We have lots of trees. But for the JA set, the four elements, they just connect directly to the coax. And the shield of the coax is grounded to a three foot ground rod. And they work just as good as the ones with all the matching. The level's a little lower, so I have a preamp in the shack on the NCC2. The NCC2, for those of you who aren't familiar, is a nice little phasing box sold by DX Engineering, I think. And I also have some NCC1s, the original uh, phasing box. And just like I did on the transmit array, the, the two elements are each tied together, and the phasing box allows me to switch it in either of two directions. <clears throat> okay, more breadboarding. This is a typical feed point. Uh, again, I scrounge up an awful lot of hard line, so let's use it on the beverages. If the horses happen to step on it, no damage. You know, RG6 might, might not be the same. Uh, so I'm winding, winding little WHAI style transformers. Uh, 
hardwired directly. When I'm walking my dog, I can check at these things. I don't have to open up a box to see if they've been blown by lightning or anything. And for weatherproofing, we, we put old soda bottles to good use. Thank you, VE1ZZ, for that. Okay, again, everything doesn't have to be shiny and new at my station. Some of it is now, but for many years, I didn't run full power. Back, back in Connecticut, when we were getting revved up on this band, I was running an FT301S, 25 watts output. You had a 100 watt amplifier. I did add a 100 watt amplifier that, that, that I was using when I worked vs 6 d o Thank you, Alan. And in around the early 1980s, when they started to raise the power limit on 160, so you could use more than 100 watts, I said, no, no, I don't need it. Well, I got beat badly in the first contest where the power level had been raised, and that was the end of that. I put a couple of 813s together. At least then I was getting 700 watts. And then in 1984, my friend N3AD, when I joined the Franklin Radio Club, did some tower work for him, and when I, I got done, he said, could you use a new amplifier? I said, well, I got some 813s. He said, let me give you a real amplifier. <laughs> so the one in green there, the green panel on the right, was an RF deck that K2SB had made and probably used for at least 25 years. The single four 1000 grounded grid. And I didn't really have the right supply for it, so I could only get about 1100 watts out of it. Couldn't run full power. But for 25 years, that was my amplifier on 160, and that helped me get so many new countries. Today I've got a KPA 1500, and I can use the, use the full 1500 when I want to. But a lot of good memories from that amplifier. Uh, there, there were, this was what I call my poor man's alpha. It was six amplifiers, all single band, and I had homebrew switching that would switch with the rig so that I didn't have to reach out. But most important, it had 160. Okay. If you ever saw the movie The Great Escape, Jim Garner was my hero. <laughs> he was the scrounger. And I scrounge. I scrounge cable. I go to junkyards. I hardly ever buy anything new. Well, radios. More, more today, but over the years, I didn't have the money in the ham radio budget for new stuff most of the time. So we scrounged. None of my top towers were bought new. Um, this is a run of hard line going out to the, the main three towers and lots of stuff there. Labeling is important. Keeping records is important. I'm going to start that one of these days, Adam. <laughs> okay, just to give you some of the stats. I've got eight towers. They're all grown. 25, 45, and 55, add them all up, and I have 736 feet of tower. That's vertical. I've got a few more on the ground just in case. Lots of radio wire. Add it all up, at least 125,000 feet. Sizes from number 24 to number 10. At least 20,000 feet of hardline and coax. Currently, 19 HF and 6 meter Yaggies on the towers. We won't count the TV antennas so we can get over the air TV. 24 single wire and phase beverages. A couple more that are currently in use, but the wires are still there. Uh, four broadside end fire, 34 foot tall receiving vertical arrays, and the two 34 foot receiving vertical arrays. We do use some accessories. On the left is a part of the uh, main station, the K3S is my main transceiver these days. I also acquired an FTDX 101D, and I'm still on the learning curve on that, uh, the KPA 1500. But I really get a lot of use out of the NCC1. I have four of those, and the NCC2 paging boxes. And on the wall there are the, the three uh, top 10 switching uh, six-way relay boxes, which are ganged to give me 18 positions. And I have some other switches for switching the various beverages and receive antennas. Uh, that's a major conversion we're doing right now. My son remotes in, uh, he's using an IC7610 that sits in my shack. He won it at the contest dinner last year. And 
he lives 10 miles away, but he's, he's using my antenna farm. So we're trying to get everything switched over so he can have access to everything. And, and we, we, we decided to go with the Green Heron system, and we've been using that, and we're still in the conversion stage there. My friend N3RD was uh, visiting for a Franklin Radio Club meeting at our place last summer. He looked around and said, this is a lot of maintenance. And it is. Thanks to a bunch of turkey vultures sitting on one side of uh, this 10 meter beam that I had just put up a month before, I've got to fix that. <laughs> and there's always something to fix. They're not all working all the time, but most of them are working most of the time. As Tim mentioned, I keep a nearly daily vigil in the mornings, uh, CQing on 1820.6 CW, and sometimes it pays off. For many years, I was in the news business, and of course, that's one that never sleeps. And if you're chasing the Exxon 160, it's the same way. My ham station can never be down. I'm making changes, but it's gotta be up and running all the time. But we don't know when that new one will show up, the one that wasn't announced. In the late 1980s, uh, one, it was in July, and Jeannie and I were chatting in the ham shack an hour before sunset one afternoon, and I had the rig setting on 1827. There was an operation from OJ Zero, Market Reef. I needed it. But no way was I going to work it in July. There's, there's no dark path. So, but I figured, okay, we'll sit here and we'll at least listen to the frequency. Maybe we can hear somebody calling them from Europe. And we were chatting, and at one point I said, wait a minute, let's be quiet. <laughs> I'm hearing a signal by 1827 through the speaker of all things. And it was the OJ Zero. And I got him on the first call. Wow. <laughs> so, sometimes the band just surprises you, sometimes you just get lucky. Some of the results, some of the cards, 329 uh, countries on the band, all 40 zones, uh, a few first place wins in the CQ 160 contest. Uh, SV2 ASP, Mount Asso. I did a little uh, missionary work, we used to call it, to get Monk Apollo on 160. My last name is Zane, but in Greek, is Zaimis. So I touched base with a couple of the Greek ops that I've worked on 160 and I said, can you guys help? <laughs> can you get Monk Apollo on 160, which you haven't been <coughs> on very much, at a time when we can work them? And I showed up on the appointed night when they had asked me to be on, and there was a horde of Europeans calling them. And I figured, no way, this ain't gonna happen. But it was like the word parted, and suddenly he was calling me, and this was sideband, one of the few countries that I only have on sideband on 160. So we were fortunate to get that, and some other good stuff. And we're still looking forward to uh, some more good stuff. Now my last new one was A50 BOC, December of 2019, and it's been the longest dry spell for me since, but I guess I'm sure Wall and Jeff can tell me, the more you get, the longer it takes to get a new one. So I'm still trying, trying for those. Thanks very much. My website has a lot of more details on the station, pictures. Uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Hey, John, uh, are there countries that are on that would be new for you? Yes. Uh, AP2, there's a guy operating there on FT8. According to PSK Reporter, he's never made it past Europe, but I'm hopeful. Um, Tango 88 is probably the most active country that I have never worked on 160. I've heard it a couple times. The guys from Japan go to the, this hotel station downtown where it's very noisy. Uh, I got on FT8 specifically to work these guys. 
I was reluctant, my son will tell you. <laughs> I didn't want to get on FDA right away, but he loves it, bless him. Uh, so I'm ready. And, and some US guys went there last November and found out even though it was supposed to be a quiet site, wasn't. So that's one I'm still looking for. Uh, I think there are a couple more out there, but not as like, well, 907 AA, great op. Yeah. We just need them to find a quiet location. So, and then others that, you know, we're just not gonna see on one state, on any band for, you know, North Korea. I mean, I've got that on all bands. I've got all countries on, on all bands including P5, but uh, there's some on 160 that, I don't know, if I live long enough, maybe. So how does the uh, A3LR array stack up against the DSDF? It, it's, when, when they're both working the way they're supposed to work, the broadside end fire toward Europe, an SU that are two better. Good. Yeah. It was worth all the work, and it was a lot of work. All those radials down on my knees, <laughs> through the woods, across the lawn. <laughs> so, John, you've invested a lot of money in these NCC controllers. Yes. So, tell us a little bit about why that has proven to be a good investment. Well, you could do it with fixed phasing, uh, but it's just more flexibility, and it was easy. You know, I had plenty of feed lines, so instead of fussing around out there with switching remote switching to change the phasing and switch it back and forth, but the real thing is that it's the, the variable phasing. If you, if you, most of you have probably read Owen for UN's book and you look at the pattern and the, with different delay factors in the phasing. So depending on where your noise is coming off the back, you may want 140 degree delay or 130 or 120 or something else. With the NCC1 and NCC2, you got them all. So you just, Tune it for the best null or the best signal strength. That's that's where they really shine. Well, when you put your first log beverage out, it's like a switch. It's like wow. Isn't yes. It? Yes. What was it like when you put your phased beverage in? It, it was another. It was another leap up. Absolutely. Yeah. It's a big commitment. A lot of work. Every 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 increment, every antenna change, and a lot of those beverages, the one that. And I didn't show them all to you. <laughs> I crisscrossed the property. Uh, were the expedition inspired? Yeah. You know, somebody was going to go to South Sandwich, uh, 120 degrees. So, oh, I don't have a wire in that direction. Now, the transmit arrays are also good receiving tests. Um, I, I had missed a set D9 in North Wilmington back in the 90s, and. When we moved, there was a ZD9 going to show up. I slipped out of work early that day. I knew he was coming. And I'm driving home and thinking, I don't know if I can hear him. I don't have a beverage in that direction. <coughs> well, wait a minute. I've got the K3LR array. Southeast. Yeah, that's exactly what I want. So I got home, raced in, forget dinner, turn on the rig, and there he was on the transmit antenna, and I got him. So, yes. Um, in terms of uh, hearing and working with the X on 160, we're, we're coming into a solar maximum peak. Yeah. How will that compare to the previous sort of five or six? Well, it's different, but I've worked new countries through peaks and valleys for the solar cycle. Uh, I worked Asia. You know, at Sunspot Highs. VS 60 I think was one of those. 1980, where were we, Frank? <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I kind of ignore the numbers. The, the, the predictors have never really been there for 160. You just got to be there. Or be there every day. Ted. When you call CQ every morning, I'm always wondering this. When you call CQ, are you listening through all your receive antennas on every CQ? Or do you call CQ a few directions and then listen? How do you do it? Okay, There's, in the ideal world, I'd have NO3M's um, switching system that will, with a voting system that will find the best signal that answers you and, and lock in on that beverage. But I didn't do that. He, Eric actually offered me the technology and I, I just didn't have it in me to build all that stuff. 
So I'm usually listening, you know, if it's in the morning and I think JA might be coming in, I'm gonna listen to the Northwest. Uh, this, this past season has been very weird, I think because I had some local RFI sources, but the best antenna to the West consistently was my first antenna that I put up for JA, 400 foot, 450 foot beverage, single wire, trounced the 935 foot broadside phased wires for JA, trounced the short vertical array. And I don't, I don't know why it is, I'm not gonna touch that antenna. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I actually started to put up a second element to make it a stagger phase, and I said, eh, I'm not sure I want that yet, because I don't wanna mess it up. You know, so when you get one that works, stick with it. So you're sticking on one antenna generally? Usually, yeah, and uh, full disclosure, I have a set of Sony wireless headphones, analog wireless headphones. I'm walking around the house, I'm making my breakfast, I'm, 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 I wonder, I'm multitasking, <laughs> but you know, I'm close enough, as soon as I hear somebody coming back, I'm racing in and getting on, on the key myself, so. I don't have a <laughs> Any other questions for John? <clears throat> All right, John. Great. We've had a lot of really good presentations here over the years, but this one's very special because there's there's takeaways here that you can take away ideas from John, and, and he's very responsive on email too. So if you think about a question that uh, that you wanna ask John later on, make sure you just email him. And John always says, hug your favorite tower climber. <laughs> that's, that's on the bottom of all the emails. And uh, that goes without saying, he's a, he's a great resource uh, for towers and also on 160. So thank you so much, John for putting that together.